Well, good morning, everyone. If you're new with us, uh, my name is Casey, and I want to thank you for being with us. If you're not new with us, thanks for coming back. Uh, If you are new with us, as a reminder of what Joe said earlier, there is a Connect card located in the seat back of the chair in front of you. If you'll fill that out, and before you leave, visit the welcome table. There's someone that will be there, and they would love to take that from you and give you a gift for being with us today. We're so glad that you're here. Can we do, though, can you do something here? Can we welcome those that are new with us as well as those watching online and let them know how glad we are they're with us? Yes. So thankful you're here. Uh, get out your notes. Uh, turn, open your bulletins there inside your notes. We continue and actually finish this series today that we've been calling Grit. And uh, jumping into the teaching, I want to let you in on why this is such a meaningful series for me and what kind of led uh, us to do this. I, I read a book uh, at the beginning of 2019 that was by Angela Duckworth with this title, Grit. And it's in this, it's, a, it's when passion and perseverance meet. It's, a, it's, a, it's the title of the book, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. And she talks about this, that high achievers, and you can read the book, and, and this is a secular book, so this is not a Christian book. But in it, she talks about how what sets people apart that achieve great things is just this one dynamic. It's grit. It's not talent. It's not knowledge. It's specifically the grit, this endurance, this perseverance. And I began to take this, and I began to think through the, the things that she wrote about in the book, but mainly take it through the filter of Scripture, because this becomes our filter in life. Scripture is our filter in everything that we do as Christ followers. It's our filter. And I began to think about this through the filter of, of Scripture, and I began to look at grit as it looked in scripture, specifically the early church, and I begin to see where was grit evident within the early church, and was it present there? Then I begin to ask the question, is grit evident in the American church, and is grit evident in our church? And, and really, I was evaluating my own life in all of this, saying, is grit evident in me? And as I began to think about this, reading it through the observation of Scripture and the filter of Scripture, the comparison of grit that I saw in the early church that was evident with the early church, these first century disciples who followed Jesus, and then as I began to compare that, the comparison of that grit with the American church, our church, and my life, honestly left me questioning. And it was a surreal thing because what I saw in the early church doesn't really match the American church. And when we, things get hard, (laughs) when things get hard, what do we do when things get hard was the pressing question. And I began to ask, do we have the passion for Jesus the same way they did? Do we have the passion for Jesus and the perseverance to follow Jesus so we can bring Jesus' kingdom life? Or (laughs) do we give in or try to get out when things get hard? Or do we get out or try to give in when the right thing to do is not the easy thing to do? See, this is why we need God's grace. In the middle of the trials that we face, which has led to this teaching big idea that I believe has emerged through, is, 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 is comes through the, the teachings of Scripture, especially when we saw this first week in, as we looked at the life of Paul, that this is the series big idea that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. We end this today, but I hope this becomes a way that we live from this moment on and a product of who we are as we follow Jesus. See, grit is persevering with grace revealed in trial. See, this is God's grace that he reveals to us in the trials that we face. And because of his grace that he reveals to you in those moments that you need him most, you can persevere. And as we talked about that, you can, that you can stand under. And you may want to give in to it, but you can stand under it and you don't have to give in to that temptation. And in that moment, when you're, you, you're under the pressure and the trial and, and you want to get out of it, no, you don't get out of it, you stand under it. Why? Because of the grace that we received in the trial. See, when you stand under that trial that you face, relying on God's grace, not only will you make it through, but I believe God will be seen in you. This was evident in the early church. This is what God's grace did in the early church. And this is the reason Christianity is so prevalent across the globe today. It's because of God's grace revealed in the trials that that church in that first century 
faced. And see, we can't do this alone. We can do this only by God, with God's help that he gives us through his grace and through the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And this is why we've been saying it this way. It takes grit to follow Jesus. And following Jesus builds grit. See, grit is not getting on the treadmill and going for 14 miles or going out for a run and going for, in, your, in, in your metaphor of life, going and doing a 14-mile run and on one sin. Grit is getting on the treadmill the next day. Grit is getting back on it. The, grit is not letting it knock you down, but you staying under that. See, that's grit. And Jesus' invitation is a, is a daily invitation to follow him. It's a daily following of Jesus that builds grit in every one of our lives. And Jesus' invitation is for everyone. It's an invitation he extends to everyone to follow him. And it's an invitation he extends to this gritty life that he modeled for us. See, following Jesus takes perseverance in the face of hardship. It takes endurance in the face of suffering. And it takes doing the hard thing when it's not the easy thing. That is the invitation God gives to you and I. And following Jesus, I'll just tell you now, it's not easy. Following Jesus is not easy. And Jesus never sold it to be easy. Following Jesus is this. Following Jesus demands that all of our life is devoted to Jesus and in our relationships with others, we are selfless. This is the invitation Jesus gives clearly in scriptures, is is this invitation that, that demands all of your life. And it's an invitation that in your relationships with others, you follow him by being selfless. And Jesus' teachings would point to this. When when Jesus would be around, he would take, in this Hebrew world, he would take the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament, and he would say, yes, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. And this is what they would say. This is is how we are devoted to God. And Jesus would do something unprecedented in this time. He would elevate something. He would say, he would attach another command to that command. And he would say, yes, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And the second is like it. The second is equal value, just like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. And in doing this, Jesus does two things. And the first thing is this. is, is see, we c- here's a reality, is you can love others and not love God. There are many people who do not love God. There are many people who deny the existence of God. And they, have a, they, they can love others. You, see, you can love others. You can do the loving thing. And you can have a genuine love because we're all made in the image of God. We all contain the capacity to love. You can love others and not love God. But you cannot love God without loving others. You can't. And Jesus does another thing in this moment. He identifies that anything less than loving your neighbor as yourself, anything less than loving other people as you love yourself, is less than God's requirement to follow him. In other words, anything less than loving your neighbor as yourself is selfish. See, following Jesus is not easy. And in this, Jesus would model this life that he would teach and he would teach his disciples to live this life and model it before them. And he would live a selfless life and he would invite them and invite you and I because of what the story has been passed over and passed on and on and preserved. And he would invite you and I to follow him. And he would say these things and see, he would invite people to follow him. And this is why Jesus would say things like this. The son of man, which is a term he would give to him to identify himself as the Messiah, this Hebrew Messiah, this deliverer that was promised. The son of man must suffer. Hear this. (laughs) This is the invitation. Must suffer and many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, to all those that were there listening, not just his 12 disciples, to everyone there that was listening. And it would be preserved so we can hear this today. Whoever wants to be my disciple 
must deny themselves and take up their cross daily, not just one time. But after you get that cross, you're going to pick it up the next morning. You're going to pick it up the day after that and the day after that, that you're going to deny yourself daily. Daily, you're going to take up your cross and daily, I want you to follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? See, Jesus' teachings were hard. They were clear in what the demand was. And to me, this is a miracle that people would want to follow Jesus after hearing things like this. It's a miracle to me that people would, after they would hear these types of teaching, they would want to follow Jesus when Jesus clearly identifies that the cost and the demand is everything. But I believe people did follow Jesus because they saw a miracle. When someone comes claiming to be the author of life, and that man selflessly gives up his life, three days later comes back to life, you trust that his words lead to life. That, right there, the resurrection of Jesus provided all the evidence that the people in this first century needed to follow Jesus and to trust that his words were the most powerful words that ever could be said. And that's why they recorded it. And that's why you and I get to read it. And we have this invitation to follow Jesus in the same way that he invites that first century church to follow him. Why? Because there is life in Jesus' teachings and Jesus' resurrection Proved his teaching leads to life. A way of life that is daily, exactly what Jesus said. Daily denying yourself. Daily dying to yourself and daily following him. And the reason we do this, the reason that you and I can do this, the reason that we can daily deny ourselves, daily die to ourselves, and daily follow him is through his selfless sacrifice. For us, it's because of what Jesus offers you and I in his selfless sacrifice for all of us, and he gives it to you and I as a free gift. See, following Jesus is a daily sacrifice of my selfishness because I've received his righteousness. That's why we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus daily, it's this daily denial of ourselves, not because it's easy for me. Because of what I received in this free gift that he's given me. I didn't have to earn it. I didn't have to do something to get it from God. See, I don't follow Jesus because it's easy or I'm trying to get something from God. I follow Jesus because of what I've received. And Jesus being the perfect life and his death and his resurrection, giving me a gift of his righteousness, a gift that only I could receive and not ever earn. And this is exactly what Paul would teach, and he would specifically write a letter to a church that was persecuted in Rome under suffering before Christianity was popular or culturally even acceptable. They were persecuted in Rome. And this is what he would write to them. He would would remind this church in Rome of what they've received that they've received peace with God. And he would talk to them and he would say, I want you to remember that you were sinful and you were sinners like everyone else. And before you point the finger at everyone else, I want you to look at yourself because you're just as bad as who you think is the worst of the worst. But because you've trusted in Jesus, death and you've trusted in his resurrection, you are made right with God. Therefore, you are righteous before God, not in your own effort but in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. And this would be exactly how he explains what Jesus did for humanity. And he would write this in in Romans chapter 5 after he talks about, hey, you've received peace with God because of what Jesus has done for you. Not because you did the right thing, but because you've trusted that Jesus' death and resurrection did everything for you. And he would say consequently because of that. 
Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. So he reminds the readers and he tells you and I, just because of like Adam, which was in the original creation story, because Adam did the selfish thing and disobeyed God, Adam made every human being sinful. In other words, we can't be good enough for God. And he goes, because of that, so also one righteous act, which was Jesus dying on the cross for us, resulted in the justification in life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, referring to Adam, the many were made sinners. See, that's why we have the sinfulness about us. It was because through Adam, we're all made sinners. But the good news is that also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, the many would be made righteous. See, when we receive God's love for us by trusting in Jesus' death and his resurrection, when we trust in that and when we receive his forgiveness, Jesus brings us, the, he brings us new life because we recognize as soon as we accept forgiveness, it's a recognition that we're sinful. See, you can't receive forgiveness without recognizing your sin. And we receive his forgiveness while recognizing, yes, that we're sinful and recognizing all those things that we've done against God and against others. And in so, we are right with God by receiving a gift, not by earning a gift. See, it's by trusting in Jesus' effort that he finished on the cross and his grace that it is extended to all who would trust in his perfect work on the cross. That's how we can stand before God receiving a gift of righteousness so we can stand right before him. See, we don't do what's right to be right with God. That's not righteousness. That's legalism. Trying to be good enough for God, trying to do what's right and, 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 and do the right thing over and over to get something from God or to earn God's love for you, that will wear you thin and wear you out. And that is religion. Trying to do the right thing to earn something from God is not the pathway of following Jesus. To do the right thing to earn something from God is legalism. But I don't do what's right because I, I, I don't do what's right to be made right with God. I do what's right because I've been made right with God. There is such a, a stark difference in this. And that is justification. That word justification is just as if I never sinned. And it's not because I'm trying to be good enough in my own effort. But because of what he's done, I receive it. And therefore, because I've received his gift and I've received his life, I therefore will do the right thing. And that's why I do the right thing, because I've been made right with God. See, I recognize my need for forgiveness because I am sinful. And therefore, I receive God's grace that's given through Jesus by trusting in Jesus' sinless life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection that is life-giving. That, that's why I, and that's why I want you to follow Jesus. Not to be right with God and follow him, but because you've been made right with God. That's why we can daily deny ourselves. That's why you can daily die to yourself. And that's why and how you can daily follow him. See, Jesus would make this even more clear. So the best picture of God's love for you and I and the message of the gritty life that he calls us to the night before he goes to the cross. And you've heard me talk about this time and time again, and we'll continue to talk about this night and what Jesus teaches in this because of this, this becomes the one thing that just transforms Christendom. It transformed the world. And on the night before Jesus would go to the cross, he'd get his disciples together and he would say this, and you've heard me teach it again and again. He would say the, that there's a new command I give you, a new command. And, what, and in this, it goes, a new command I give you, love one another. And everybody's like, they're going, that's not new. You've been saying that from the beginning. But then what does Jesus do with this new command? He gives it a new identity. He says, as I've loved you. This is the new definition of love. 
See, you have all your definitions of love, and we love to hang on to our definitions of love because it justifies a lot of things that we don't have to do. But Jesus removes all of those rules, and he says it right here. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you might be able to. No, you must love one another. And Jesus would give the clearest picture of that love on the next day, on the following day. The disciples would see the clearest picture of love. And now you and I can see the clear picture of love because of what we have written in the Gospels uh, that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we can see God's love for us in Jesus' love for us by selflessly giving up his life. So you and I could freely receive his life and follow him daily, deny ourselves, daily, die to ourselves, and daily follow him. That takes grit. And doing that builds grit. A daily, always doing it, always doing it. Daily following him, redefining in your relationships with others, what are you going to do? It's, and you're going to always do the loving thing with others. And the way you do the loving thing, which is the selfless thing, that's going to build the grit it takes to follow Jesus. And I want you to write this in your notes. This is how we're going to talk about the, the, the teaching big idea that I want to end the series with. See, always doing the right thing, which is the loving thing, even though it costs you everything builds grit. Always doing the right thing, which is the loving thing, even though it costs you everything, builds grit. Not doing the right thing to be made right with God. See, that's not the key. But doing the right thing because Jesus has made you right with God. Not doing the loving thing that you define as love so you can justify not loving, but doing the loving thing that Jesus identifies as love in the way he's loved you. And identifying that the right thing to do is the loving thing. That in your relationships, when you don't know what the right thing to do is, that you look through the filter of Jesus and say, how did he love me in this situation? How would Jesus have loved me if I was in their shoes and Jesus was in mine? That's the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do, which is the loving thing to do. And selflessly giving up our life. See, the loving thing is what Jesus shows. He gave up everything. And even though it might cost us everything, we will follow him. And even though it cost me in my relationships with others, I will follow him. Even though it might cost me, it might not cost me everything in one relation, but it might cost me uh, something in another relation, but I will still follow him because there is a cost. But it's not that I'm doing it to earn something from God. I'm doing it because I've received everything from him. And this is what Paul would continue to write and encourage this Roman church that you can't be good enough for God. And he would say, the wages of sin, yes, they earn you death, but there's a free gift of God that is yours, and it's eternal life through Christ Jesus your Lord. And then he would go on to say to them, yeah, I know it's hard. It's hard to do it. And some things, the things you want to do, you can't do, and the things you can't do and you don't want to do is what you end up doing. But I want you to know that there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. And because of that, there is something that God's given you that when you follow him and you put your trust in him, he gives you his spirit, which is enabling you it's enabling you to do the selfless thing because the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And he would go on to talk about the amazing love that God had given us through him because of, and he's showing us in the grace that he's given us. And then he would flip the page and he said, this is how you live now. Because of God's love for you, this is how you live. And he goes, therefore, I urge you, and I want you to look at this. Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In other words, I beckon you. I plead with you. In view of Jesus' love for you. In view of Jesus' love for you. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember the words of Jesus? If you want to come follow me, you got to daily Deny yourself. You got to daily die to yourself. 
daily follow me. See, this is the living sacrifice. This is the living sacrifice, putting yourself on the altar every day. That's the gritty life. Therefore, because of, in light of Jesus' love for me, in view of his love for you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and what he would say proper worship. You know what worship is? You responding to who God is. And we see who God is and what Jesus has done for us. You know what love, true worship is? Loving others the way he has loved us. That is true and proper worship. And then he goes on, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't get caught up in the patterns of school, of everybody else at school. Everybody else at school is doing it. Don't get caught up in that pattern. Don't get up, caught up in the pattern of, of your colleagues at work. You know, everybody else is doing it. I don't care if everybody else is doing it. What Jesus do for you? What's Jesus, what, what, what's in view of his love for you? I don't care what they're doing. I, I, you know, in, in, in the political scheme of things, I don't care what's going on in politics in view of God's love for you. What must we do? He goes, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, in view of God's love for you, don't come form, but transform. By the renewing of your mind, allow the Holy Spirit to change you from the inside out. See, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the power to be selfless. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, the Holy Spirit will change you from the inside out so you can think more like Jesus. And when you think more like Jesus, you think more selflessly. The whole world, the world entices you to do the selfish thing. That's the pattern of this world. The world entices you to do the selfish thing. That's what everything around you is wanting you to do, to make you do what's best for you. But that's not the Jesus thing. See, the Holy Spirit is alive inside of us, and the Holy Spirit enables you and I to do the selfless thing. That's the power of God's work inside of you, is to do not the thing that just pleases you, but do the thing that honors and serves and is best for others around you. See, the pattern of this world is to do what's best for you, but following Jesus is allowing the Holy Spirit to enable you to do the selfless thing. Always doing the right thing, which is the loving thing, even though it costs you everything, is what the Holy Spirit wants to lead you to do. And it enables us to love others the way Jesus has loved us. Us. And then Paul would go on in this and he would say exactly that. You can't, you can't work out this without community. And he said, I don't want you to think of more, yourself more highly than you ought. Because as soon as you begin to think of yourself more highly than you ought, you begin to think that you don't need other people around you. And then he brings everybody back together. You need the community of the Christ around you. You need the body of Christ around you. That's why you've been given gifts and God's given his love to you. And in all that, it's not for you. It's for the people around you. And he goes on. And I encourage you to read Romans chapter 12, 13. And, and just see how, read the whole book of Romans, it's amazing. And in this, he gets to this. And I just want to let his text finish today's teaching. Because he puts it all under the banner of love. This is what we must do. Love must be sincere. You know what sincere love is? I'll tell you more easily what it's not. Sincere love is not sincere when it's selfish. It's not sincere, sincere when it's self-serving. Love is sincere when it's selfless. That's why we would go on to say, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Not good for you. In light of the sincere love, what's good for others? See, evil is loving someone else less than you love yourself. And when you do what's good, you do what's best for someone else. See, Jesus identified what good was. So be devoted to one another in love. See, what does sincere love look like? It's a commitment to one another. It's a commitment to the other. It's not a commitment to myself and everybody goes, I, why are you doing that? Because you're committed to me or you're committed to you. No, it's sincere love, is selfless love that's devoted and committed to someone else. And he goes on to say, honor one another above yourselves. What would it look like for you to honor your spouse at home above yourself? 
See, sincere love is selfless love. What would it look like to honor your boss who's making it hard for you and your company? And everybody else is talking bad about him or her. What would it look like to honor them, him or her, above yourself? What would it look like to honor the person on the other side of the political line above yourself? Not because of where they stand in, in your political view, but in view of Jesus' love for you. What would it look like to honor one another above yourself? See, that's a sincere love. That's a sincere love because this is what Jesus has done for you. And this is what Paul brings it back to. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. See, you do all of this, and, and this is all you think to serve others. No, 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 no. See, this is serving the Lord because when you serve the Lord, you can't serve God without serving others. You can't show your love for God without having a sincere love for others and persevering in that. Be joyful, he would continue. Be joyful in hope. Patient. And that word patient is that same word we looked at in a couple, a couple weeks ago, that hupomeno, to stand under the affliction. See, be joyful in hope and stand under your affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is why we want you in groups. This is why we want you to lead a group so you can practice hospitality. You might go, like, okay, Casey, I'm not good at hospitality. Neither am I. I'm not great at hospitality. But Paul tells me, in view of God's love for you, practice hospitality. I need to practice hospitality. This is why it's so important to invite people over to your home. It's why it's important to, 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 when someone does something for you, you invite them back over to your home. It's a practice of hospitality because, not because of what I want to get from them, because of what I've received in Jesus. That's why in a minute I'm going to give you an opportunity to give it into a group so you can practice hospitality. He goes on, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Can I just tell you quickly why we curse? Just be honest. We don't get what we want. See how selfish it is? That's why you curse others, because you're not getting what you want. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. He would continue to say, live in harmony with one another. You know, when you can't live in unison, when you can't agree, compliment. Live in, live in harmony. Not live in harmony. And, and he goes on to say this, and I want you to under, write this in because this is the important thing. Do not be proud. See, in a band, there's nothing more annoying than a distasteful musician who doesn't realize how to support the other instruments. <laughs> Don't be proud. Live in harmony. And, and, and he goes on to say, but willing to serve others and associate with others. Be, able, be, be willing to ser- associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And I know this is hard, and, and this is a landmine, but this is a great guideline here. See, right is something that is seen or appears to be good or honorable. And Jesus gives us the best picture of good because he claimed to be good. And only Jesus is good. And when we follow Jesus in his command to love others the way Jesus has loved us, we do what is good. And he goes on to say, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, don't, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Always doing the right thing which is the loving thing, though it costs you everything, builds brick. Love must be sincere. And what Jesus did on the cross was the most powerful act against evil in this world. And it through, oh, see, when the disciples took this command to love others the way Jesus has loved us, 
it overthrew a government because they did the loving thing, which was the right thing. And it cost them everything. See, the right thing to do, which is the loving thing to do, is the powerful thing to do. And this is the invitation he extends to you. Will you follow me? And this is the invitation that we will do this together as we journey in loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and continuing to share Jesus the way he shared his life with us. I want to pray in a second, but I want to tell you that our life group leaders are going to be at these tables. I encourage you to get in a group. See, you can't do this alone. You need the Holy Spirit's work within you, and you need a community around you, and this is your opportunity to take a next step in a community of believers. I encourage you to find a group. The days are listed inside of your bulletin. If it's easier to see it by days and the names of the group's uh, leaders are up there on the wall, you can find them. Let them know. Sign up at their table and let them know you want to get in the life group. Let me pray for you as you continue to follow Jesus and build grit. Father, we're so thankful for the grace that you've given us. And I ask you right now that you continue to let your love enable us and let your grace be revealed in us in the trials that we face so we can follow you because it takes grit to follow you and it builds grit as we follow you. And today, whenever we face the hard thing, which is not the easy thing. May we always do the right thing, which is the loving thing, even though it costs us everything. And may that build grit in our life. In your name, Jesus, amen. God bless you, Westside. Our life group leaders are at their tables. Go sign up for a group today. Christ would have with them. Oh my God, where?